give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name. We will make known to all nations what God has done. Sing praises to our Lord, to the Lord our God. We will tell of all God's wonderful acts. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us seek the face of God today and always. Praise the Lord. Now we'll join me in on page 63, singing all creatures of our God.
God tells him, go, I will help you to do that. So um, Moses does go back. And oh, God tells, Moses asked God, well, who should I tell them is sending me? And he said, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And my name is, I am who I am. So tell them, I am, I sent you. So Moses goes back and he talks to the Pharaoh and he does eventually lead the people out of Egypt to God. And um, I, I wanted to kind of talk today a little bit about an experience I had recently that was way cool. And um, I keep thinking about if Moses hadn't noticed the bush, we wouldn't have any of this story with him. Because God wouldn't have got Moses at least not right then. And I was on a full trip a couple of weeks ago with Boy Scouts, and um, we camped on the river all night, so we get up really early. We were on the river by 7.30 that morning. But it had stormed the night before, so things were really damp, and it was really foggy on the river, which is really cool. And as we were going down, the sun was just creeping out a little bit, and like spider webs looked like chandeliers on trees. It was so awesome. And the farther we went, the more the sun came up, and we started seeing rays coming down from the sky, which I love rays like that. And we round a bend in the river, and there's a tree with the sun right behind it, and it was glowing with these rays. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And it was shining down on the water, and there was see, um, fog coming up. So I turned around the scoutmaster was in my, my canoe, and I and he goes, I go, can we go through it? And he's like, you bet. So we go through those rays. And it was the most close I've ever felt to God in my life. It was warm. It was misty. And, and he's going in the back. He's like, Joan, do you think this is what the gates of heaven look like? And I'm like, I don't know, but if it is, I hope I get there someday. Because it was just the most amazing. So what I wanted to, to say is sometimes as we go through life, we have cool moments, but we don't really think about God. And I am sure God was there in that moment because it was the most amazing feeling I've ever had. So as we're going through life, look for God because we don't want to miss him when he's talking to us. Okay? Yeah, I really appreciated that message, and it's very important that uh, we are you know, recognizing hope that that's an emphasis of, 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 of all that that we do in our lives. And I hope that you're always left with that when we leave here every Sunday, that we need to, to pay attention to God. We need to, we need to look for God in our lives. So that's, that's a very important message, and I appreciate you sharing that with us. And I was thinking about routines and thinking about that beginning of school routine, and then as I read this passage about Moses, and I read the first part of this passage, I thought, well, you know, Moses, Moses must have, have established a pretty good routine here in his life. Uh, if you read a little further back in Exodus and read what's going on and try to piece together the history of where we are here, uh, Moses, of course, last week we read about, you know, he was born and, and all the, the ch Hebrew children were going to be killed. So, you know, he was placed in the basket in the river and he was found by the Pharaoh's daughter and he ends up being raised in Pharaoh's household and cared for by his own mother, but raised in, in the Pharaoh's household. And then we fast forward to some other things that have happened that we sort of missed there in Exodus with the story of Moses, of, of all these things that happens, and he sees this, this Hebrew man being beat up by an Egyptian, and he just can't help himself. He jumps in there, and he kills the Egyptian and, and saves his, his kindred, the, the, you know, the Hebrew man there. And then the next day, um, he sees some other things happening, and he tries to intervene, and, and uh, the Egyptian, you know, says, well, are you going to kill me like you did the other one? And Moses gets all scared, and he, has, and he decides he needs to run off and flees. And then that's where we find him in this story. He has been in this land now for a long time, and he actually has married. He has settled down. Um, he has become a shepherd and a goat herd here in this land. And if you read it, 
uh, the Bible closely, you'll realize that he actually has been in this particular land now for almost 40 years. Can you imagine the routine that he's settled into in his life now? You know, he's been doing this for 40 years. He's married. He's got this go. He, he's got this responsibility, which was an important responsibility at that time, uh, to, to be the shepherd for this particular herd. And so I, I can just imagine his routine that he's been doing every day of his life now. You know, he, he gets up every morning and maybe has some of that Caldi's coffee. You know, they're supposed to, they, they've had it around forever. Uh, but, but he has some of that. He goes in and he gets himself ready. Maybe he kisses his wife goodbye. But then he goes out and he gets his flock. And he lets his flock out and he, he leads them up and they go out and he grazes his flock all day long. I mean, that is his routine. And that morning of this event that we're looking at, that morning he got up and he was responsible for taking care of this herd of sheep or goats that he has. That was his responsibility when he woke up that morning. When he went, back, went to bed that evening, he was responsible for leading the whole nation of Israel out of slavery. What happened? What happened? And one day, he changed from being this shepherd whose responsibility was to take care of that flock of sheep being the person who's responsible for leading the Israelite people out of bondage, out of slavery in Egypt. It's remarkable to me that I really believe, if you read this passage closely, that the only reason that this happened, that this occurrence takes place, and all the things that, that follow this particular event that we think of as the burning bush, the only reason that it happened is because Moses, Moses was paying attention. Moses was willing to turn aside to pay attention to God in his life. And his life changed. And so the title of my message this morning is Paying Attention. Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Moses, on this routine work day for him, just like any other day that he'd been living for the past several years, on probably his thousandth trip up Mount Horeb there. Maybe he was following a runaway sheep or a goat. Well, Moses at that time, on that day, he catches a glimpse of this strange sight, maybe out of the corner of his eye. And he goes to investigate and his life is changed forever in remarkable ways by God. You know, to me, it's interesting that God should come to Moses at this point in his life. Because from all we know from reading scripture, Moses was not a particularly religious man at this point in his life. In fact, there's no sign at all to this point that Moses even worships God. The one true God. Because after all, Moses grew up bowing to the golden Egyptian idols in the Pharaoh's household. You know, Moses' lack of familiarity with God may explain some of his reluctance to jump at the opportunity that God seems to afford him in this encounter at the burning bush. And it seems that a call from God isn't necessarily like winning the divine lottery. Moses seems to point that out when he responds in this passage here. Who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and try to bring the Israelite people out of Egypt? Or as it's translated in the Living Bible, Moses says, but I'm not the person for the job. I'm not the person for the job. Moses 
Moses seems to be saying, me, God, you can't be suggesting that I could go, could you? I mean, I'm a worker. I'm not a leader. I'm not one of those behind-the-scenes people. I'm not an out-front person that, that leads and takes charge. Have you ever responded to God like that? I know I have in the past many times. began to flow like honey, just like they did for Moses here. I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, God, you don't want me. How, how can I be a preacher and a teacher? I'm not even a biblical scholar. I, I still can't find the book of Hosea without going to the table of contents. <laughs> you know, sorry, I just got to admit that. And to tell you the truth, God, you know that I've spent a Sunday or two or three or four or a lot more out in the water fishing and in the woods hunting instead of being in worship service on every Sunday. And as a matter of fact, if I want to think about it right now, just two weeks ago, I was on that cruise ship in Alaska, and I was eating to my heart's content, and, and the only service they had on that Sunday was a, was a, was on video, and it was Joel Osteen. And, no, I'm just not a Joel Osteen. Uh, I didn't even go to worship service. So you say, see, you don't want me, God. I'm very underqualified. I shouldn't be up there. You know, somebody else. Yeah, who, who wants to come up? Jacob? <laughs> okay, well, well, here's a news flash for all of us, and not just for me. We're all underqualified. We're all underqualified to do any of God's work. I'm underqualified. But so are you. All in the same boat. In fact, I would argue that we're all underqualified to even live our lives that we have set before us because we face so many things in life that are simply overwhelming for us. Things that we just can't handle on our own. Moses made excuses because he felt inadequate to do this task that God called him to alone. Well, he was inadequate, just like we're inadequate to do any task that God calls us to do. But Moses, we are not alone in these tasks. God told Moses right here in the scripture. He said, don't worry, Moses. I'm not sending you out alone. I will be with you. God says, I would never ask you to do something by yourself, Moses. You couldn't do it without me anyway. But with me, you can do it. Now to me, those assurances from God about God being present in our lives, that seems pretty convincing to me. But Moses, he, he wasn't won over that easily. He hadn't been at church most of his life, and he's not ready to give in yet. So he said, well, well, what if, God, what if your people won't listen to me. What if I tell them that I've come to save them from slavery, just as you said, and they just sort of glare at me, and, and maybe they, they cross their arms, and they say, well, who sent you? What do I tell them? You know? In other words, Moses seems to be saying, he says, not only do I not think I can do this, nobody else is going to be able to think I can do it either. You know, nobody's going to believe I, this. I'm the one that's going to do that. And then, the crucial part of the story, God does something that God has never done before, at least in our recorded history. God tells Moses a name. I am who I am. You know, later on in the Gospel of John, Jesus used all of that I am language. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus is drawing directly on this state from Exodus to show his divinity. It's God speaking, saying, I am who I am. For Moses, and for us, I think, that name is both comfort
comforting and mysterious. It's comforting because it, it reminds us of the rock-solid stability of God. In a world today and 4,000 years ago when nothing really is stable, when jobs are not very secure, when governments come and go, fall and rise all the time, when economies are even worse with their up and downs, and even our own bodies as we age, we find out our we can't depend on them, or they're not that secure, they're not that stable. When absolutely nothing seems to be stable in life, God stays God. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses is our God today. Right here in St. Genevieve in 2000. And we can put our trust in God just as much as those people did thousands of years ago. God is the great I am. There's comfort in that. But there's also mystery in that name that God revealed to Moses and thus reveals to us. I am who I am. What does that mean? Okay, God, you are who you are, but who are you? When we're faced with our own crossroads, when we're faced with our own tough decisions in life, when we're faced with those crises of faith that we have in our lives, what does that mean to us? What does it mean for God to say, I am who I am? I really believe that each and every person has to answer that question for themselves. Who is God in your life? You know, another translation of this, this passage, this God's naming himself to Moses, uh, is I will be who I am. Will be. And, and let me just veer off here and talk a little bit about the Hebrew here in, in this part of Exodus. This is one of, if not the most difficult passages for Hebrew scholars to translate. The statement of God to Moses that we translate almost universally in the English Bibles into I am who I am. That's the way we translate it. But if you talk to someone who's a scholar in ancient Hebrew, and they read the, the most original text that we have in the ancient Hebrew, and they read that passage, there's a lot of discussion about what that actually means. What is God actually saying here? A, a little bit about the Hebrew, just, just like our language. The Hebrew has a, has a past tense, has a present tense, has a future tense. And... and the way the Hebrew language is written, there are different declinations, different things that, that you add to the words that indicate those tenses, whether this is, whether this is past tense or, or present condition or, or, or current condition or present tense. And in this particular passage, in the ancient Hebrew, there is no indication of tense in these words. It's just the root words. It's the root of to be, God saying, I be, but there's no indication that it's God is currently. I am, the word we use is am for the to be designation here. God could have been saying, and some people argue this, God's saying past him. I was who I was. Others argue, no, God, it should be translated in the future tense. I will be who I will be. But most English translations settle on the present. I am who I am. Most, no, I don't know about most, but a lot that I have read of, of, of Hebrew scholars today looking at this tend to agree that there's no indication of, of, of time here, of, of tense, past, present, or future. So they say, a lot of them say, it should be all three. There's no indication of past, present, or future. 
future. So it should be God saying, I was who I was, I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. To me, it sort of broadens the description of God to think of it in that term, but, but, but I, I digress. Uh, in other words, when God says, if I am God, or I was God, or I will be God, what that means for us, what that means for you, depends upon where you are in your life and how you live your life. Who is God in your life? You know, for Moses, God may have been, I am your Lord. For others, God may be, I am patient. Or for others, at other points in their lives, God may be, I am forgiving. For others, God may be, I am loving. For me, for most of the time, God is saying, God is, I am with you. So who is God for you? That's both the power and the mystery of God in our lives. God says, I am who I am. To Moses, right there on that burning bush. So after a little more hemming and hawing around, Moses finally agrees to God's plan. And the rest is not only history, but it's epic movie material for Cecil Moses' journey to Egypt is the most important event in the history of our faith, at least until that night in the manger with the shepherds and the angels and that bright star. Hopefully you all remember that particular story. It's found in Matthew, and then if you don't get it there, it's, it's found again in Luke. Um, but did you know that this story, this story of the burning bush of Moses, almost never we almost never had any of this story and the stories after. No great plagues, no Ten Commandments, no Trump testing with that cool beard. No way that was the sun bottle. But 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 one thing, one split second action made the difference in this entire story and in the whole history of God's relationship to God's people after this action. One teeny tiny little thing saved all those slaves, the entire nation of Israel, all the Hebrew people. Moses is just there doing his daily job and his daily routine, tending to his sheep when he sees this burning bush. And the Bible says, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, then God called him from within the bush. Moses pays attention to God's signal to him. That's the thing. That's, that's what got the whole ball rolling. Instead of keeping his head down or, or ignoring this strange sight or, or just plodding through his day and Maybe going and telling somebody else, hey, you know what I saw out there in the, in, in the fields up on the mountain today? Moses pays attention. He goes over and he looks. He examines what's going on. And then God called to him. You know, Moses could have said, wow, that bush is burning. It looks like it's not even burning up over there. Oh, that's strange. I think maybe I should check that out. But, but you know, I've got a job to do. I've got all these sheep here, over here in front of me. And you know, I think the wife, maybe she's making liver dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I've already taken the two breaks from work this morning, and I'm just doing more. It was certainly his choice. His attention was his to give or not to give. But by giving his attention, by actually paying attention, his life was forever changed and enriched by God. Oftentimes, the circumstances
circumstances of our lives and the many, the many, many great distractions that operate in the world around us keep us from focusing on God's presence in our lives. God is right here. God is in the midst of the storm. God is in all of this chaos that we call life, but we're often so distracted that we don't even look. We simply don't pay attention to God. So my question to you this morning, in your life, in your life today, right now, today, what is it that's keeping you from paying attention to God? From looking for God right here in your life? What distracts you from seeing God's presence all around you, everywhere, and especially today? I mean, we're, we're all guilty of it. We all complete our routines every day, day after day. We tend to our sheep. We, we have to go to our jobs. We pay our bills. We, we do our best to be good family people, to be good citizens, and even to be good churchgoers. We fight the good fight, and, and we try to keep a smile on, even when it feels like there's not much to smile about. But maybe, just maybe, God's calling us to something greater, to something more. Maybe there's a burning bush in our lives, waiting for us to, to turn aside from our hectic pace and our frantic lives to take our noses off the grindstone for a minute and our hands off the panic button and pay attention to God. And, and when we pay attention, when we really look for God in our lives, maybe, just maybe, God's waiting. Moses, Moses, he paid attention that day. He saw a bush that was burning but not consumed. Well, today, today, God may work differently, but no less powerfully than he worked in Moses' life. You know, my burning bush was just a few years ago, a late night conversation with my wife when she said simply, why don't we just go? You know, your burning bush may be a crisis in your life that you face. It, it, it may be an empty nest that you have in your home now. It, it may be a job change. Or it may simply be an invitation from somebody you know. Maybe somebody in this church to serve or to teach or to lead or to assist with the food pantry or, or to partner to help with the silversmith's house. God speaks to you through those kinds of situations. And it's your choice. It's your attention to give or not to give. Do you pay attention and look for God in your life every day at all times? Or do you just ignore it? Because, you know, you think you're inadequate or you're Qualified, or, or you're not ready, or you, you just don't have enough time. There's just not enough time in the day. Well, let me tell you, my friends, you woke up today. Maybe you had some coffee. I don't know if it's coffee or not, but maybe you had some coffee. Maybe you read the paper or you, you scanned the internet. And when you woke up this morning, you were probably responsible for several things in your life or for doing for your job, doing your job or providing for your family taking care of your children, or, or maybe just making it through the day with your sanity and with your hope intact. That's, that's all we can do some days, just making it through the day. But there's a call here for you. Somewhere, God is calling you. Maybe you've heard it, and you're 
actively pursue it. Maybe, maybe you haven't heard it yet. Maybe, maybe you have heard it, but you don't know how to respond. So my friends, what would happen? What would happen if you decided to pay attention to God today and say, here? In seminary, you know, we have to have all these terms for everything, and we refer to it as a theological perspective. Looking for God, God's presence in all of life. But all it means is life changes when you start paying attention to God. What would happen if you invited God to do something extraordinary in your life? If you are paying attention today and really listening to God, who will you be tomorrow when you wake up? Something to think about. Pay attention. <coughs> Pay attention to God. Shall we? Generous God, we struggle each and every day to pay attention to you. We read our Bibles, we study, we, we pray, we do what we can for others, but do we really pay attention and try to listen to what you are saying to us each and every day? Help us to hear you now, Almighty God. Give us the ability to listen God, we thank you for your presence with us here and now. Amen. At this point in our service, we have an opportunity to respond. To respond by giving of some of those blessings that have been bestowed upon us. And also at this time, as we are hopefully giving generously uh, of our tithes and offerings this morning, we have the opportunity to listen to God's word to us as presented to us as Don sings a special number for us this morning. So as the ushers come forward, please give graciously and listen attentively, attentively to the words of the song. Come back to me, so I just want to share it with you. Mm -hmm. 
Glorious and all of and God, we choose to sing songs about you this day. We celebrate your glory and your love bestowed upon us today and every day of our lives. We ask you now to help us to pay attention to all those who are in need around this world. 
guide us to recognize that you know, this is not what you intend for our world. That hunger and warfare and violence and brutality are not your plans for your people. And yet these things do exist. Give us the courage to step forward to address these wrongs as we strive to walk in your ways. May your grace, your peace, and your love descend upon all those who are in need this day. Those who are sick, those who may have been mentioned here this morning, those who go unmentioned but are also in our thoughts and in our prayers, those who are suffering injustice, those who are in need in any way, may your love descend upon them just as it is descending upon us right now. And continue to be with us as we pray together the prayer of Jesus Christ, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God is here to all of us. God is here to all of us. God 
God comes behind us, God goes before us, God stands right beside us, and most importantly of all, God is right here with us and inside us as well. So Jesus said, and have a happy day all tomorrow. Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support.